based at the Center for Space Research here at Northwest University. Um, yeah, about myself. Um, I'm here. I don't know if you can see me, but you see me here. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, I'm currently an associate professor of physics at uh, the university. The university has uh, three campuses and I'm based on one of them called the Mahikeng campus. The others are the Pochefstrom campus where the Center for Space Research is physically based and we have the Val campus, which is uh, close to Johannesburg uh, as the third campus. And the main campus of the university is based uh, on the Pochestrom campus. Okay. Pochestrom, uh, that's the place I've been to. Oh, you have been there. Okay. Yes. So you had 200 kilometers away from Mafeking. I see. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so my affiliation is basically the Center for Space Research, where it deals with research-related uh, activities, and I'm based in the so-called physics subject group. We have a school system, not a traditional department system, so we call it the physics subject group. It is one entity based on both the Mafeking and the Pochefstrom campuses, and the Mafeking side is basically uh, where I am based. And it happens that at the moment I am also heading that uh, Mafi King section of the subject group. Um, as the Center for Space Research, uh, there are you know, top rated scientists working in uh, heliospheric physics, in astrophysics, in, um, in space physics and all kind of uh, uh, astrophysical sciences. And that's where we also host the NASP program for the uh, Northwest University Node as of a uh, couple of years ago. And uh, before that, from 2015 to, to 2018, I was a senior lecturer in the same institute and uh, I also act as a junior focus area coordinator for mathematical physics at the Center of Excellence for Mathematical Sciences which is uh, physically based at the University of uh, Witwatersrand in Johannesburg but it has nodes across the country. I'm also a junior associate of the National Institute for Theoretical Physics which is based uh, the main headquarters is based in Stellenbosch, but it has nodes in at Witz and UKZ. And uh, I also occasionally uh, teach at the Ethiopian Space Science and Technology Institute as an adjunct staff. And in fact, I have uh, supervised some PhD students there as well. Um, and before that, 2014 to 15, I was a postdoctoral research fellow at uh, the same institute. Yeah, at the University of Cape Town, 2013. And uh, for a semester, I was also a temporary lecturer at the University of Cape Town in 2014. And this, uh, <clears throat> it was during this period when I was doing my master's at the National Institute, uh, National Astrophysics and Space Science Program that UKTV came to give us a lecture on uh, particle cosmology and that's where we met. And uh, I did my bachelor's degree in physics at Addis Ababa University in, in Ethiopia. And you might be surprised, I'm not sure, to hear this, but I was also the f one of the first alumni of the uh, uh, African School of F 
physics in 2010 when it was held in Stellenbosch. I attended a few of the lectures the first few days, but uh, it was the first year of my PhD, so I had to travel back to, to um, um, Cape Town to to deal with my studies. So I didn't attend the full school. I apologize for that in retrospect, but I actually did attend it the first few days. Okay. Um, broadly, my research interests include uh, modified theories of cosmology, in particular the F of R and F of T theories of uh, gravity and the cosmological uh, implications and applications. I will briefly talk about it towards the end of my talk. And in the context of cosmological perturbations, also I study the uh, series of large scale structure and the mechanisms um, that produce it through the so called coherent uh, formalism of the cosmological perturbations. And I'm interested in the early universe cosmology like inflation and uh, those uh, cyclic cosmological models. And uh, in the long term, I am also. Uh, nowadays being interested in uh, aspects of quantum gravity and quantum cosmology. All right, from me, that was basically my word line. Um, from here, I will just talk about the, the main theme of the, the, the day, which is my brief introduction to cosmology. Is that fine? Sorry, I was muted. Thank you. It's fine. All right. That's, that's basically about me, briefly. All right. So let's briefly talk about pre relativistic and relativistic physics, and I'll take you uh, through a brief journey as to how we reached to our current understanding of the standard model of cosmology, right? So our understanding of the, the world has obviously evolved over time from ancient Aristotelian um, physics where, you know, they, he described motion of objects meaning that they are trying to reach their natural abode, in which he put this, the Earth as the center of the, the, the universe to uh, uh, our current understanding of relativistic and quantum theories of physics, uh, as developed by uh, pioneers like Einstein, Planck, and, uh, and the like. We have gone through a large number of iterations of ideas, um, through uh, centuries and millennia. So our current understanding is not to be uh, taken for granted, you know. It has passed through uh, many iterations. Uh, you know, we have, we have all heard about Ptolemaic picture of the, the universe, the, ge the geocentric model, to the Copernican picture in the uh, 16th century by Copernicus, uh, the heliocentric uh, picture, rather, to the Galilean relativity to, through Newton's universal gravitation and all this. They have contributed their own um, bit to our current understanding. And uh, it might be surprising to hear that even until the beginning of the 20th century, we basically had uh, our conception of the world, the universe in, in general, as being our um, Milky Way galaxy. So uh, it was only people like uh, Immanuel Kant, a German philosopher, who dared to think that there might be places outside of our own uh, galactic environment and called this kind of conception as island universe. There might be island universes outside of our own. So even 
about 100 years ago, when we talk about Einstein developing his general theory of relativity, we are basically talking about the physics of everything that is confined with what we now know to be a very tiny fraction of the, the totality of the universe. Uh, but then what next, you know, that's uh, the other also uh, aspect that I want to touch on. Is, is physics complete as described by uh, relativistic physics and quantum mechanics um, in the form of general relativity, special relativity and, uh, you know, the standard picture of quantum mechanics or is there something more that we need to, um, to study and describe? Okay. So I have prepared this with the understanding that most of the students might not have uh, uh, an experience in advanced cosmology. So I have started talking about what cosmology is. And you see that cosmology studies about the large scale structure, the origin, evolution, and the ultimate fate of the universe as a whole. And it answers. Or at least so, Amari, some, some, some of the uh, participants said they can hear you very well. Oh. Uh, Make it, what's the problem? You can hear at all? Can other people hear? Can somebody, uh, okay, it looks like other people can hear. So, uh, Make it, is that? Do uh, you want to check um, your gadget? But could you hear me better? KTV. Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. So, Meiki, so please uh, double check your, your, uh, uh, your setup, okay? Right. So, I was saying that cosmologists attempt to answer questions like the size, the shape, the geometry, the, the age, of the, uh, of the universe at large and how it formed in the first place and what will happen to it in the future. And as I said uh, briefly earlier already, uh, we think modern cosmology started about 100 years ago when Einstein developed his general theory of uh, uh, relativity. And um, what this theory basically meant was that the uh, the universe evolves in such a way that there's some kind of uh, balance between the geometry and the uh, matter content of uh, it. So solutions to Einstein's equations were found to show that the, the universe uh, expands. But this was very contrary to the conception of the the universe at, at the time, because as I said earlier, there was, our understanding was limited even during Einstein's time, uh, that the universe was the, the solar system and the, the solar environment around it, which is the Milky galaxy, and no one expected it uh, to expand. Okay. But then, I mean, there is always this, uh, uh, connection between gravity, which is what Einstein developed the theory of, and cosmology. But why is cos gravity important? And our, uh, we all know that uh, there are four fundamental forces that we know of at the, at the moment. Uh, the strong interaction, the weak interaction, uh, gravity and He seems to be the only one that is significant on the largest possible um, scales. Whereas, although electromagnetic forces can also interact you know, over large distances, the universe is more or less neutral. So we don't consider electromagnetic forces to play a big role in the dynamics of the universe. The other forces, the, electro, uh, the weak interaction and the strong interaction, as you know, they only act at very small distances inside the atom, basically. So they don't play, at least that's what we think at the moment. Uh, there is a question in the chat, Said. Yes. 
Go ahead. Sorry for the interruption. I was just wondering, like, you as a cosmologist now, how do you see yourself being different from an astrophysicist or an astronomer? Okay, uh, that seems to be an interesting question. So it's basically a question of scale, you know? When we talk about astrophysics, we normally talk about the stellar structure, evolution of stars, and sometimes probably up to extragalactic scales, you know? But uh, cosmology, as I said from its uh, basic definition, studies about the largest possible scales and uh, the universe in general. But traditionally, you can, you can think of me as an astrophysicist as, as well. But specifically for a, 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 the technical jargon, cosmology studies, studies the largest possible scales beyond the extragalactic scales. Astrophysics studies the stellar and uh, galactic scales and space physics studies the uh, smaller scales like the solar system and uh, things smaller than that scale. You know? That's how I define it. And astronomy traditionally is considered to encompass all of these scales. Yeah. Although it's, it literally means the study of astronomy means the study of stars or the naming of stars something like that but traditionally we think of it as a, 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 that field that discipline that considers uh, both smaller and larger scale uh, science does that answer my your question absolutely absolutely all right thanks all right so thank you very much. Now that we start talking about gravity, we have two main descriptions of gravity. Also, we, we also had the other theories by people like Aristotle thousands of years ago. The main contenders to our understanding of gravity in the modern sense are that by Newton, where there is some kind of fictitious force that exists that permits all of space and exists between uh, two massive uh, uh, objects and it follows that inverse square law as, as you know and we have this other description which is a radical really different description of uh, uh, gravity defined as the curvature of the space-time due to the presence of matter around it so that's the prevailing um, understanding of gravity as described by Einstein so according to Einstein, instead of things falling towards each other due to some kind of fictitious force between them, things follow, massive objects follow a curved space that's created by, the, by themselves. So matter tells space-time how to curve and uh, fr from the relationship that I'll show you in a, uh, in a bit, space-time also tells matter how to move. So space-time by its curvature tells matter how to, which path to follow. And uh, the matter tells the space-time how to curve, basically. This is some kind of uh, uh, Laconic expression given by some famous astrophysicist called John Wheeler. And uh, so I said the theory of gravity describes the expansion of the universe through this kind of, uh, relationship between the geometry which uh, you have on this side on the left side and by the matter content which you see on the right side and this equation is actually 10 partial differential equations which are coupled and nonlinear and you can imagine how difficult it is to solve this this uh, system of equations it's an extremely complicated system of equations and without making some kind of uh, assumption on the matter content or on the geometry, it's practically impossible to solve them, at least analytically and numerically people are trying all kind of um, approximations, even analytically, to be able to solve them. And by us talking about these 
system of equations describes an expanding universe, we mean basically that if we have two uh, structures like two galaxies in the space time, let's say this and these two galaxies, over time you'll see that the, the, the separation has increased. That's how we think of the, the expansion of the, oops, what did I do now? Of the, um, the universe. The separation between any pair of galaxies in the universe is on average increasing and that's how we know the universe is uh, expanding. Einstein did not like the expanding universe idea, of course, because you know the understanding at the time, the prevailing paradigm was that we have a static universe. So to stop the expansion, he added something called the cosmological constant. We now call it the Einstein cosmological constant. And its, its purpose at the time was to stop the universe from expanding. And it turns out that nowadays we need it for a completely opposite purpose. Uh, namely to explain the accelerated expansion as I will describe uh, a bit. And Einstein himself called it the greatest blunder of his academic career later, when it was found that the universe was observationally confirmed to be expanding. So for so many decades, this quantity was uh, ignored and thrown into the dustbin, but I'll, I'll explain later why it was reinstated um, in the 1990s, the late 1990s. So observations by people like Hubble showed that there are also other people, by the way, but Hubble is, seems to be the, the um, uh, leading astronomer at the time who once and for all showed that the expansion of the universe is real by um, showing that there's some kind of um, relation between the speed at which thing, uh, galaxies are moving away from each other and the separation between them. And the farther away objects uh, were, the faster they were moving according to that, uh, this relationship. And this is the famous Hubble uh, diagram. And what it means then is that if the universe is expanding and it's of a certain size today, if we run the clock back in time, there it must have started from some kind of small and extremely dense state, which we normally call the Big Bang. Okay. And uh, as is often the case, of course, the Big Bang theory was not bought by everybody. So there were some contending theories, uh, most notably the so-called steady state um, theory that in the 1950s, 1960s was uh, bitterly competing against the Big Bang Theory. But in science, we usually need some kind of observational evidence to support a theory. Otherwise, that theory will be uh, uh, thrown out. And in fact, you notice that the Big Bang Theory, the, the word, uh, the phrase Big Bang was actually um, coined by the proponent of the steady state theory to just ridicule the, the whole idea of the universe starting from uh, a singularity or a hot, dense state, all right? But it's, it happens to be the favorite word of cosmologists today. So um, basically the, the main idea of the steady state theory is that the universe remains the same in all its evolution and it has been and it will always be. There is no such thing as a universe that is expanding, okay? Whereas in the Big Bang theory, we start from a, an extreme. You can see in the first, um, picture. Whereas here, we have a steady state. The universe doesn't, the energy density doesn't get any smaller or bigger over time. And it remains like that um, forever. So as I was saying, theories are needed to uh, uh, distinguish between two, uh, observations are needed to distinguish between two theories. 
and uh, an accidental discovery by people like Penzias and Wilson, who discovered the so-called cosmic microwave background, which is a relief of radiation from the uh, initial stages of the universe, showed, as predicted by people like Gamow, that um, the universe, in fact, started off from a Big Bang-like scenario, okay? And since then, since the 1960s, mid 1960s, the Big Bang theory is now the most favored theory that tries to explain the evolutionary uh, stages of the, the the universe at large. And it, it has successfully explained quite a lot of uh, um, things as I will briefly describe. Um, and as of um, by astronomers, the universe today seems to be a more or less uh, homogeneous and isotropic on the largest possible scales uh, structure that expands in all directions. And if we look, if we zoom in to the uh, smallest possible scales, we see some fluctuations in the uh, in the large scale structure, and these are the fluctuations. Uh, for example, measuring the temperature of the CMB, the cosmic microwave background that I just alluded to a while ago, um, where well, it was about 380,000 years uh, after the Big Bang. Okay, so these fluctuations you'll see in the, in the CMB are what. Um, uh, appear to be the fluctuations in the temperature uh, of the same way. All right. And one of the important things in, 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 in that uh, description of the field equations I, I showed you earlier is that if there is matter, that's the one, that, that's the one thing that um, uh, determines the destiny of the evolution, right? And depending on the presence and the amount of the presence of matter, we have this so-called um, flat, closed, or open universes. And depending on which geometry the actual universe has, we might have an expanding universe that expands for a while and starts to reach a maximum size and contract into a big crunch, right? Into a big crunch, Singular, another singularity. Big Bang singularity, then another singularity. And some theories suggest that there might be another Big Bang starting off from this singularity. These are the so-called cyclic cosmological models. If we have, on the other hand, a flat geometry, like a tabletop, for example, then that kind of uh, universe with that geometry might be expanding forever, but approaching some kind of asymptotic uh, size at uh, T infinity at infinite time. On the other hand, if we have this uh, so-called open geometry, which is this one here, then that kind of scenario might result in a drastic uh, um, accelerated expansion of the universe that might tear up space-time itself and end up in what we call a heat death, a thermodynamical heat death of the universe. And if you ask me now, so which one is the universe today? Observations seem to suggest that the universe is more or less flat, but this is not uh, a closed case. Seems like the observations show that K is uh, close to zero. Um, but, uh, you know, given that the history of science has shown so many uh, surprises, we cannot for sure conclude that we are living in a, in a, a flat universe as, uh, as we know it today, okay? But the... So the concordance model, what uh, is referred to as the standard model of cosmology is, um, assumed to be homogeneous and isotropic, as I, as I said earlier. By homogeneous, we mean if we look at all regions of space, they look alike. 
there are no preferred locations in the universe. Our Earth might be, for us, a special uh, place in the solar system, but in the largest possible scales of the universe, there's nothing special about it. And um, it also is isotropic, which means if we look at the sky in every possible direction, the large scale distribution of structures looks more or less the same. There are fluctuations, as I showed you in the CMB earlier, that those fluctuations are so tiny that on the largest possible scales, we tend to think that we are living in a homogeneous and isotropic universe. And the, the standard model of cosmology is based on the Freeman Lemaitre Roberts and Walker metric, which is uh, a globally homogeneous and isotropic expanding or contracting space time. You might remember from spatial relativity that uh, uh, in Minkowski space we have uh, ds squared given by minus dt squared plus um, dx squared, right? So this is a static universe description, uh, the Minkowski space. But if we now let this kind of universe expand and also change the geometry, be, be it flat or closed or open, then this is basically what we will get. This is the so-called Freeman Lemaitre Robertson Walker metric. And our cosmology is at the moment, as we describe it, uh, based on observational evidence, we think that this is a correct metric that describes the geometry and the general behavior of the universe. So as we saw earlier, if k is one, we have a closed universe. If k is zero, we have an, a flat un universe. And if k is minus one, we have an open universe. And the, the one quantity that describes that the universe is expanding is the so-called scale factor A, which is function of only time, not dependent on R, theta, or phi, as you can see. And that's why we say it's homogeneous and isotropic. It doesn't depend on those other uh, spatial uh, component uh, coordinates. And the rate of expansion, I have to move now faster. The rate of expansion of uh, the universe is given by the so-called Hubble parameter here, which gives us some kind of normalized parameter. Um, and it gives us an idea of how fast the scale factor is expanding. And an important quantity in cosmology is the redshift. And it tells us that the, this is a quantity that tells us that, for example, um, galaxies are moving away from us or coming towards us. If it's moving away from us, we have a, a redshift Z, a positive redshift. If it is coming towards us, then we have a negative redshift or a blue shift, right? And um, uh, this is one of the most important quantities that uh, um, we have in cosmology. And then if we use some kind of uh, Taylor expansion on the um, on this expression here, we can actually show that uh, the so-called uh, hubble metra relationship between the speed, as I said earlier, peculiar speed of galaxies and the distance they are from each other is given by this kind of uh, proportionality. And the Hubble constant as a result, this is one of the quantities that was measured in cosmology by people like uh, uh, Hubble. It is one of the most important cosmological parameters and it, it gives us a lot of uh, information about, for example, the age, the distance from as of a certain uh, cosmological object and the like. So uh, it's measured in uh, kilometers per second per megaparsec, but uh, we also measure it in per second. And uh, you'll see uh, that this Hubble parameter being a, a, a dynamic quantity changes over time, but the presently estimated value of that parameter is called the Hubble constant, H naught, the H naught that uh, we saw here, 
this is just the present value of the Hubble parameter. And even that uh, quantity has um, changed its value depending on which uh, uh, observation one uses from, you know, Hubble's time up to here is, for example, up to 2016, you'll see that there has been a, a dramatic change in the values of the, um, the Hubble uh, constant. And even as recently as this year, there have been updates on the value of the Hubble constant, but it doesn't mean that this is now a dendil. We still, uh, observational cosmology uh, is still trying to constrain this quantity further and further with as much uh, accuracy as possible. And uh, this is an ongoing process. So, but the currently accepted value of the Hubble constant is more or less around 70 kilometers per second per mega per second. Which means that, by the way, it, it simply means that if the, we have two galaxies that are, um, uh, let's say, um, a mega parsec away, then they are moving away from each other at around 70 kilometers per second. That's what it means. But if they are farther than that, they will be traveling faster than that. And then if we talk about the dynamics, so far we talked about the kinematics. If we talk about the dynamics, then we have the matter content, which is usually described in the standard model by some kind of a perfect fluid with an energy momentum tensor of uh, this type. Okay? Here, mu and P are energy density and isotropic pressure of the universe. And this U, a is some kind of a four velocity vector at which the fluid um, system is moving. And this guy here, GAB is uh, the so-called metric tensor. It describes the geometry of the universe. And even from here, you see that there's some kind of connection between geometry and, and the matter. And uh, from the energy momentum conservation, we have this kind of relationship the energy density changes with time according to this kind of conservation relation. Theta here is a newly introduced uh, parameter, three times the Hubble parameter. It gives us the expansion of the universe in all the three directions. And hence, three times H. So it's a volume expansion, basically. And they now to solve this equation, we need to assume some kind of relationship between mu and p. Otherwise, uh, this is a, not a closed system. And we usually write this kind of equation for a barotropic uh, fluid, um, where w is our equation of state parameter. Once we do that, we can actually solve this equation to, to show that the um, if we assume some kind of equation of state parameter. For example, for radiation, if we assume W is one third, which it is, then we can actually tell the relationship between the energy density and the scale factor, the energy density and the temperature of the universe, um, and uh, the like. So for dust, pressureless matter, we have W zero. For radiation, we have W one third. For um, the cosmological constant, as I will talk about it later when we deal with the dark energy scenario, we, we think W is minus one. And uh, based on this, we can actually find out that dust energy density decays with scale factor like this. And expanding universe, you expect the energy density to decrease anyway. And um, for radiation, you see that the energy density decreases like that. And temperature scales with inverse of the scale factor. As the universe expands, you expect the temperature of the universe to decrease, and that uh, proportionality is uh, an inverse proportionality, as you can see. Okay, now talking about the expansion, the, the expansion of the universe is described by applied the Einstein field equations or GAB equals TAB equation that we saw earlier, to um, 
specific systems and showed that the equation, which can be simplified to this uh, kind of uh, uh, equation without the cosmological constant or with the cosmological constant uh, as added later, it describes that uh, how the universe expands, but as affected by the presence of matter and the geometry of the, the universe, okay? Mu, as you remember, is the energy density, the total matter per unit volume. And K, as you remember, is uh, minus one, zero, or one quantity we talked about earlier as the curvature of the three spaces. So you'll notice from here that to describe the expansion of the universe, we need both the matter contained and the geometry to be specified. And if we talk about, uh, and when we talk about mu, we of course mean the total energy density in the universe. It's not just the energy density of one specific fluid that affects the expansion. Expansion is a global um, quantity. So we need a global parameter that describes uh, the, its behavior as well. And that is the total energy and the total uh, geometry. So this quantity here, the cosmological constant was as I said, introduced uh, uh, earlier, but then removed later for some, um, for some time, for a few centuries, uh, decades rather. And then it was reinstated later to derive uh, an accelerated scenario, right? This, uh, this being a lecture, I have given some exercise here that the interested reader can just um, look at and try to solve. The other important equation in cosmology is the so-called Ray Chaudhry equation, described, uh, derived in the 1950s by uh, this relativist called Ray Chaudhry. And it describes the uh, accelerated expansion or the acceleration of the expansion of the universe. So A double dots, so a dot is the rate of the change of the scale factor, which, so it tells us how the scale factor is expanding. And a double dot tells us how the expansion is changing over time. So basically it's called the acceleration of the expansion. And you will see that if we have this equation with a minus sign on this side and we have no cosmological constant, and standard matter assumes this so-called strong energy condition where rho plus 3p is a positive quantity, then a double dot remains a negative quantity. And this means that the expansion is decelerated. So without the cosmological constant then assuming standard form of matter, with a, a positive equation of state parameter, rho plus 3p remains positive, okay? And therefore, a double dot by a remains negative. And that is why I will show later, we need some kind of mechanism to make the expansion uh, accelerated because observations in 1990s showed that uh, this quantity should actually remain a positive one. We actually de de defined this so-called deceleration parameter for historical reasons. People were expecting a decelerated expansion, so they called it a deceleration parameter. And we, it, it was found to be negative. The deceleration parameter has a negative value in front of it already, a negative sign in front of it already. So if this quantity after measurement becomes a negative quantity, then it means Q negative means acceleration. And that's what the observations showed. It simply means a double dot is positive. So given that this equation without, uh, this equation without the um, cosmological constant is always negative for normal types of matter with positive pressure, we needed something extra balance that and if this lambda is bigger than the other term is the minus half rho uh, plus 3p term it means we can have an expansion and that, uh, that's accelerated and that's exactly why lambda can be a good candidate for example for an accelerated expansion but 
it has its own problems and uh, um, uh, that's why people are looking for other alternatives to the cosmological constant okay uh, i'm going to jump this but something nice for for the interested uh, reader to go through and um, solve the exercises and find some kind of interesting cosmological solutions depending on the geometry you assume depending on the matter content you assume um, if you assume vacuum for example um, what kind of expansion you expect the vacuum is there is no matter content in the universe then you expect is this kind of uh, exponential expansion because there is no gravity to stop the expansion the universe expands faster and faster so there are different cases that one can consider and see um, there and then that was basically the kinematics and the dynamics how about the cosmography which simply means how do we measure size and distance I, earlier i said cosmology studies for the size age and things like that of the universe so how do we measure that one so it's a very challenging task because uh, we do not have the most accurate data that we need to describe the universe plus there is also an extra complication due to the expansion of the universe so how do we measure distances for example between galaxies how do we measure how large the universe itself is how do we measure the age of the universe you know this is considered under uh, cosmography and one of the some of the points that we normally talk about when talking about the uh, cosmographic uh, scales of the universe are the Hubble time which is basically one over the Hubble parameter if we know the Hubble parameter we can calculate the Hubble time which which basically tells us how much time it would have required the universe to expand from the initial state to where the value of the Hubble parameter today is, okay? And the Hubble parameter, you might remember, I said the SI unit is per second. So if we have one over per second, it gives you the age of the universe in seconds. And based on that, if we know, for example, that the Hubble parameter is this much, we can convert it into a per second. If we know that this is the Hubble parameter, the Hubble constant today, we can calculate the, um, um the age of the universe by first converting this into its appropriate per second uh, units and taking the inverse of that and uh, you know this is some of the things one one can do in, in cosmography and this quantity the h is called the hubble distance how much the universe could have expanded during the hubble time okay so this is also one of the cosmographic quantities that is determined based on our knowledge of the Hubble parameter, which I said earlier was one of the most important parameters needed in cosmology. The other thing is the redshift that I briefly mentioned earlier in cosmology when we talk about redshift, it's an effect, a net effect of two um, uh, quantities. We have this, um, uh, redshift due to peculiar velocities. For example, if you have two ga galaxies that are moving away from each other, the relative speed between them is the redshift associated to that. And then there is also the cosmological redshift, which is because of the expansion of the universe. So it turns out that the net redshift that one has to consider in, in cosmography is a combination of the cosmological redshift due to the expansion and the peculiar velocity ratio due to the relative motion of objects such as galaxies in the universe. And usually we have the, um, um, you know, we consider co-moving uh, situations when we assume, for example, that two galaxies compared to the expansion speed, their relative speed is very small. So we, we, we consider that relative speed to be zero, in which case we have a co-moving situation and the cosmological and the um, total redshift are uh, considered to be uh, the same in that scenario. Okay, so this is what, you know, the basics of the historical development of the The 
understood picture, the universe started off in a big bang, as I said, and that kind of, there, is, there are two scenarios for the big bang also. There is a hot big bang and there's a cold big bang debate that was um, around for some time. And the, the understanding today is that we have this hot big bang model based on general relativity and it is by far the most successful of all the cosmological considerations man has ever uh, attempted all right there are so many other models people have tried people are trying but the uh, standard model seems to be the most uh, favored model for its description of redshifts of galaxies expansion of the universe right and the origin of the CMB, that was, as I said, um, theorized to exist in the 1940s, and only this hot Big Bang model managed to explain it so far. And then we also can describe the full spectrum of the uh, synthesis and abundance of the primordial spectrum of the elements using Big Bang nuclear synthesis through the standard model, and it also describes the galactic evolution distribution. Um, as far as I know, most people dealing with astrophysical uh, galactic extragalactic uh, structures they assume that the general relativistic description of uh, uh, the universe is the correct one. They they don't necessarily assume other modified, uh, except for particular reasons, other modified uh, cosmological models based on a modified theory of gravity. So on those structures, on galactic scales, astrophysical scales, the standard model based on general relativity seems to be fine. Okay, and moreover, JAR also seems to describe the universe on astrophysical scales pretty well. So. Um, I was asked what the difference between astrophysics and cosmology was. So here, for example, on astrophysical scales, by this I mean on stellar structure and uh, solar system scales, okay? Then the general theory of uh, uh, relativity is uh, doing quite well so far. So there, is a, there, there are two questions. There's one okay. about what is uh, nuclear synthesis. All right, so this Big Bang nuclear synthesis is basically yeah. the, the production of the primordial elements. How did elements like hydrogen, helium happen? And there is, um, Kitev is probably the better expert on this one, but there is this uh, understanding that the first few light elements in the universe were formed the first few minutes after the Big Bang through physical processes that we already understand pretty well in terms of the formation of uh, the fusion of atoms and some atomic nuclei. Okay, next question. Yes, Saeed, uh, if you want to read your question. Sorry, he was there earlier. Sure. Yes. Sure, sure. Yeah. Um, sorry, earlier you made mention of the fact that the orbital parameters, like it, there are some changes in the value of the orbital parameters. So I was just wondering what are the possible explanations or implications of that? That's one. And number two, in the course of estimating the age, the type, the I mean the the age of the universe. You know, we said we have to use the Hubble parameters. So since the Hubble parameters, since it varies, so how do we know what which value exactly are we to pick? Or we just pick the Hubble constant? Okay. So, okay. Uh, for example, um, Hubble, when initially he uh, um, estimated the parameter that described his diagram, he estimated it to be, I'm not sure if it's here, he estimated it to be around 500 kilometers per second per megaparsec, okay? But through more advanced technology and more 
accurate observations and more accurate techniques of observations. This, this kind of uh, uh, determination of the cosmographic quantities has improved over time. So to answer your question, why this, this change in the Hubble parameter values, it is the method used in the, in the, in the measurement plus you know, the accuracy of the, the, the techniques used in developing the uh, observational uh, satellites, let's say. And sometimes it can also be model dependent, depending on the model you use to describe your, uh, your theory, combined with the observational techniques that you use to measure those values. You might find that uh, there are different uh, values for the Hubble uh, constant. Even in the same year, you will see that different techniques uh, measure different values of the Hubble parameter. But nowadays, you don't see, for example, the values jumping from 69.8 in one measurement and another measurement tells you 500 or 400. We are just oscillating somewhere between you know, 67, 66, up to 73, 74. We are more or less around that area because it shows that our technology has advanced so much that our accuracy is more or less, you know, um, uh, certain. All right. And what was the other question? Oh, the, the age. The age. yes. The other one was related to the age, the estimation of the age, right? Even here, as I tried to demonstrate. You see that depending on which value of the Hubble parameter, based on which, oops, based on which observation you um, you used, you can estimate the age of the universe uh, accordingly. But this is not this is not the full story actually. This is just a rough estimation of how you can uh, estimate the the age of the universe. But to accurately describe it, you need other factors as well and depend and determining the Hubble constant is not the only way to describe the uh, age of the universe there are many other techniques other people use to describe it but uh, as you noticed also depending on which observation you use you can see that the age of the universe is also estimated uh, differently Sir, yeah. So depend. I mean, I just want to confirm something. I think, irrespective of the method or the models you use in estimating the age of the universe, do they hold you accurate answer, or probably there is a slight, de slight deviation? I mean, the range of the answers are they in the same? The answers we get are they in the same range? Yeah, yeah. You don't, you don't see also today that the age of the universe in one estimation is twenty billion years and in another, let's say five. Our values of the age of the universe are also oscillating somewhere between 13.7 or so to around 14 billion years or so. It's not, it's not deviating that much because we are also constrained by so many other uh, physics that doesn't let us, let's say, jump to 50 billion years suddenly from our yesterday's knowledge of 13.8 billion years. We are tightly constrained also. Okay, thank you very much. Right. So what are the challenges then? I mean, we said that the standard model describes all this uh, well. So what, what's the fuss about cosmology being in, in crisis? So the challenges are twofold. Some problems are from early universe considerations and some are late time cosmological issues, okay? In the early universe problems, we have the so-called horizon problem, which basically tells us that why, earlier we said we have the distribution of structures in the universe more or less the same. Now the question is, why do we have the structures the same? For example, we know that if we look at two extreme sides of the universe, they are about 46 billion or so light years apart. And if we take a photon from the Big Bang, the maximum it can travel is 
if the age of the universe today is let's say 14 billion years the structures remain showing similar behavior how does that happen they are causally disconnected because causation cannot travel faster than light but it turns out that the universe is you know more or less sharing similar properties how did that happen that's the so-called horizon problem and we also have things like the flatness problem why is the universe very close to flat as i said earlier why is not any other geometry if the universe started off from a closed or open universe chances of it being flat today for example is negligible how did this flatness come was there some kind of fine tuning that happened and then we have the structure problem <coughs> sometimes called the smoothness or homogeneity problem. What brought about the large scale structure in the universe today? I mean, if everything started off isotropically and homogeneously from the Big Bang, why were there some kind of uh, uh, um, matter clumping that showed in homogeneities in space time on the smaller scales? Why, why did that happen? And then we have this so-called antimatter matter problem, which I'm sure you have heard it of. Uh, somewhere else, which is basically to say that we have this asymmetry between the amount of matter and matter that was supposed to happen the uh, exists in the universe. We're supposed to have more or less the same number of matter and, and antimatter, but we seem to have this kind of uh, discrepancy here um, in the observed universe. Why did that happen? And then we have this magnetic monopole problem. Why don't we have magnetic monopoles, although from a uh, uh, field theoretic predictions, there must have been a large number of heavy, stable magnetic monopoles that should have been produced from the Big Bang. And none has been produced as, we, as far as our detections are concerned, as far as our observations. We have never detected, no, uh, uh, <clears throat> nor felt the existence of these uh, magnetic monopoles in any other way in the universe. Why does this happen? These are the early universe problems. And then we have the late time cosmology problem. Why is the rotational curves of galaxies not um, as theoretically predicted? We're supposed to follow this kind of path as you move away from the galactic center. Uh, rotational speed of uh, uh, rotating objects was supposed to uh, follow this path here, but observations show that it's actually showing this kind of uh, rotational curve. Why is that? And this has been an issue since the 1930s, not necessarily a recent discovery. Um, and there have been lots of uh, descriptions both theoretical and observational explanations to solve this. And, and um, I'll come to the point where I'll talk about the, uh, the solutions for this as well, in the form of the dark matter issue. And then we have the so-called cosmic acceleration problem, which is pro probably one of the biggest uh, challenges in cosmology today, in theoretical physics in general. Uh, and that is uh, the unexpected discovery of the dimming of supernovae. If we see a supernova that exploded some time ago, some distance away from us, there is a certain kind of uh, luminosity we, we expect to measure, but that expected uh, luminosity was deemed by uh, an unexpected factor. And that's why uh, back in the 1990s, late nine, around 1998 to be precise, this kind of dimming of, uh, unexpected dimming of supernovae triggered this whole issue of accelerated expansion. The universe must be expanding faster than we expected for the, this kind of dimming to happen uh, from the supernovae measurements. <clears throat> So we talked about the problems. So what, what are the solutions for this kind of issues? To solve the first batch of problems, the uh, so-called uh, early universe problems that I mentioned, there was a proposal by um, 
some people in the, the early 1990s, which introduced uh, another mechanism of expansion, early universe expansion. And when I say early universe here, I mean fractions of seconds after the Big Bang, okay? During this, this unimaginary small interval of time, um, the universe expanded exponentially, triggered by some kind of uh, um, scalar field, right? That has a negative, pressure negative pressure existing in an equation means you might remember from that earlier ex, uh, uh, expression i showed you for a double dot by a the, there is a negative pressure uh, here such that 3p is um, uh, less than minus uh, mu all right then this this whole thing will become positive and it will show some kind of uh, uh, accelerated expansion in other words this quantity becomes negative or a double dot becomes uh, positive and in this kind of scenario we have that issue of the earlier uh, problem of the horizon problem for example uh, that we talked the reason the large scale structure shows that two causal disconnected um, structures today share similar properties is because in the earliest periods of the universe they were causally connected but it is the fast expansion due to inflation that made them causally disconnected today uh, that's basically the kind of mechanism that this, the inflationary model is trying to put forward to solve that problem and similar expansion can be given to show that um, this in fact is uh, able to explain the other uh, problems as well the flatness and uh, um, magnetic monopoles and uh, other issues can in principle be solving uh, solved by introducing this kind of exotic mechanism so you'll see that in the standard model today we have a big bang uh, GR based cosmology that also invokes the inflationary epoch as part of its uh, um, um, uh, recipient. Okay. The other possible suggestions to solve the uh, uh, those issues of large scale structure is to consider uh, inhomogeneous cosmological models. Earlier, I said that the standard model is based on uh, homogeneous and isotropic uh, space-time described by the freeman lemaitre robertson walker metric. But if we change that metric, we might explain some of the things that that metric cannot explain, such as, for example, the accelerated expansion. It might be because, because of some large voids that exist in the universe, and therefore the universe is you know, homogeneous, that in the absence of matter, the space-time can expand faster because we, we, we drew some kind of parallel between matter and uh, uh, and geometry and the expansion from the Friedman equation, right? So if there is a void in the universe, that void region can expand faster than the other regions with uh, high over densities and, uh, and the like. So this kind of geometries, they are complicated compared to the standard model, but this is also some of the, um, the things that cosmologists do at the moment, trying to see if the inhomogeneous, inhomogeneous cosmological models can solve some of the problems, okay? And then, of course, the other is to introduce the dark side. If we put about 69%, cosmologists and astronomers estimated, 25% dark matter, 69% dark energy, and about 5% of atomic matter, baryonic matter, the stuff that stars, galaxies, everything is made of, including planets and us. And then this small amount of uh, neutrinos and photons and black holes uh, as described here, then we can have a complete picture of the universe. That's what the, um, uh, most of the people in, in, in this kind of cosmological endeavor think at the moment. So there, there, there is some kind of consensus concordance that about 25% of the 
energy budget of the universe is in the form of dark matter. It's called dark because we don't know anything about it, what it's made of, how does it uh, behave except gravitationally. And then we have the other dark energy stuff that accelerates the So we're basically about 95% in the dark and 5% uh, uh, basically what uh, we think uh, is described by the standard physics. The other option is of course to say, all right, instead of putting dark stuff there, exotic things that have no uh, fundamental origin that standard physics can describe. How about changing the whole nature of the, the theory of gravity on which the standard model of cosmology is based? Does it change anything? And in this endeavor, there are so many theories, you can call it a zoo of theories, really uh, out there. And this is not even. Um, half of the theories that you can see on, uh, on, on, uh, in, in everyday um, endeavor. So these are some aspects, some general aspects of the, the, the modifications one can consider, but every day you can say, if you look at papers on the archive, you'll see some kind of new description of the geometry or some new description of the matter forms uh, or both being considered by people. And broadly speaking, one can think of these modifications as uh, the original equation we saw was something that looks some kind of proportional constant that I set to one here, like this. <clears throat> so if you modify the matter form, then you put the, this extra stuff on the right hand side of that thing, uh, equation. <clears throat> if you want to change some, <clears throat> sorry, some uh, aspect of the theory <clears throat> that describes the gravity, then you can add the extra stuff on the right hand side of the Einstein field equations. And based on this, you can describe things become more complicated to solve and to even observationally constrain, but <clears throat> you have more freedom to describe uh, uh, the physics based on this kind of modification. In most cases, you introduce <clears throat> some kind of uh, extra field to the uh, energy content of the universe or <coughs> sorry or you you change the, the dimensionality of the universe at the moment we think the universe is at least in the standard model a four dimensional space time continuum right we have three dimensions of space and one dimension of time but if you consider other th theories like caruza klein theory of brain world models, for example, then you, you add extra dimensions to, uh, to the model, mostly extra dimensions of space, force spatial dimension, or in string theories, uh, several other uh, spatial dimensions can be added and uh, one can describe analogous uh, field equations and then their corresponding solutions and then say, okay, this kind of uh, system can describe this kind of physics. But the problem is not all the physical, uh, the cosmological problem that we saw will go away when we change the, the, the theory. No single theory consistently uh, managed to describe everything from the early universe to the late time large scale structure. So this is a problem. You might have one theory that describes some aspect of the, the cosmology, but it fails to describe other aspects and that becomes a challenge. So uh, the, the other possible uh, modification to the 
theory of gravity one can make is to increase the order of the theory. For example, GR is a second order theory, right? Second order. What it means is that the highest number of orders one can get in the partial differential equations that I talked about earlier is second order. You might have a double dot in, in appearing in the field equation, but a triple dot is not necessary. Now, if we go to higher order theories like F of R theories, which is one of my favorite theories, the one that I have been working on since my master's studies, um, then this becomes, for example, a fourth order theory. All right, this is a fourth order theory. In other words, you have now more freedom to describe physics because of the uh, the increase in the order of the theory than GR, which is limited to only second order. But then it comes with its own uh, um, complications because it becomes the second order theory I said or earlier is already complicated enough. Now you, you change it to a fourth order theory becomes a nightmare. Basically. So one should not only just complicate the, the, the theory, but try to make uh, valid physical assumptions and um, uh, make good predictions with the theory. Otherwise, if the theory is not making good predictions, it's going to, uh, to die uh, sooner or later. But FFR theories seem to be, for example, doing pretty well because they give um, uh, physical solutions that have not been ruled out observationally. Well, there are, of course, models that of this theory, specific models of this theory that do not fit in the standard picture of cosmology, but uh, not all of them have been ruled out. So there's uh, some chance that some form of modification of the theory of gravity based on the f of r description for example can be a good, uh, good. by f of r i mean in the standard einstein uh, picture we have the action of the theory discovered in terms of this r rich scalar uh, only whereas in question about the the f of r okay yeah that's the question Ah, what is R in the F of R? Yeah. Yeah, in the F of R theory. Yes, I was going to talk about it. Uh, okay. Now. So, in the standard Einsteinian picture, we have the so called action from which the field equations are derived, given by this kind of expression. Okay? R. Plus, you can add matter terms on the so what this means is this is the quantity that describes, it's called the Ricci scalar, it describes the geometry of the universe, okay? So if we change this action by making the R, let's upgrade it to some form of F of R instead of some uh, defined function, how about make it a generalized function F of R? And from that, you can have many possible models. Like for example, is f of r equals r, in which case we have gr, f of r, r is gr. How about we consider r squared or r cubed or some kind of other complicated function of r. There are so many different models of that. Now, based on this, you can describe different physics at different states of the cosmic evolution, or there is some kind of F of R model that describes the whole evolution from the beginning. So this is a, a kind of challenge that uh, we have. It might describe, for example, the accelerated expansion and the expansion itself, but does it describe the late time large scale structure distribution begin? Or it might describe the late time distribution, but still describe the expansion of the universe. So we have one theory that consistently explains everything in cosmology that is a theory that is to be taken 
as the standard theory of gravitation. But if you describe only one aspect of space and another, that Another possible theory that I have, I'm currently also working on with my students. Uh, there are some other questions. Uh, Beatrice, could you ask a question? My first question is about how do these luminous or unexpected luminous from type 1 supernova show that there is cosmic acceleration in the universe? Yeah. What is the question? Beatrice, please repeat. My first question is about how do these unexpected luminous from supernova show that there is a uh, cosmic acceleration of the universe. Then my second question is about uh, how we have seen the, uh, each content, the content of dark matter, dark energy and the baryonic matter. How do they measure it? Thank you. Ah, how the, I'm, I'm not an expert in the actual technical aspects of the measurement uh, myself, but I'm sure there are different as, uh, models and uh, observational techniques that uh, help astronomers to determine the fraction of the presence of each component. And as to how the dimming of the supernovae explains an accelerated expansion, this is also some, some kind of technical measurement to permit. And you would expect, for example, that the universe is expanding at a slow rate, then the dimming of the, the, the density of the supernova will not be far from what you expect to measure. But suddenly it has increased. And it, it is, the, the luminosity has, is much lower than what you expected. To be based on your projections of how far that that explosion, right? So what it means by seeing some kind of dim luminosity is that that supernova has been, let's say, uh, has has moved much much faster than you expected from uh, right? And that way you can estimate that if the expansion rate was this much, then you would expect this much of the luminosity to decrease. But since the luminosity has decreased by much bigger than what we expected, then it must have moved faster after the, let's say, event has happened. And that way, you can predict that the universe must be expanding. Okay. Apart from uh, those supernovas, are there other factors that you can show that the or can show this cosmic acceleration of the universe? In the retrospect today, we can, for example, look at the large scale structure distribution and see if, according to uh, standard cosmological perturbation theory, we expect a certain amount of the power spectrum to be measured, right? And then you go out and measure the distribution, you compare the two uh, uh, power spectra. And then if you, for example, see that there is less power spectrum today than, than uh, predicted, it, it might also mean that the universe did not have enough time to form the structures because it was expanding faster. Faster the universe expands, you expect the less structures to, to coalesce and uh, uh, form the large scale structure distribution that we measured. But the main reason that people uh, deduced the, there must be an accelerated expansion is through the dimming of the supernova, as far as I know. Uh, Make you have a follow up question, right? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's like um, in the F of R, uh, in the F of R uh, theory, uh, as far as I understood it, it's like um, 
it depends on the Lagrangian. So whatever the Lagrangian you will choose, your theory will depend on that. Am I right or wrong? Yes, so depending on what you choose for your F of R, as I mentioned earlier, you have different models of the F of R theory. And depending yeah. on those models, you have different possible solutions for the technology. But yeah, and it depends on the form of that function. Yeah. But uh, one last question is like, am I free to choose those variables or to choose this R, for example? Or there is a certain estimate or model to choose them? No, you are I mean, not free because you are not trained by the cosmology. That's uh, that's the problem. Yes, you are free to choose whatever uh, model you want to study for the mathematical exercise, but you know we have constraints coming from cosmology. So, in a sense, we are not free. Freedom comes at the cost. Uh, okay, so Prof, it's like what I meant is like, for example, um, there is someone will choose, uh, let's say, for example, um, R and someone else will, will choose R square and within the constraints of the um, cosmological constants. But how this, how this um, uh, different selection, I mean, um, uh, it's made. If I if I if I got to if if you get what I'm what I'm trying ah. to say, bro. yeah, yeah. For example, I mean people like uh, Tarovinsky, who were the uh, originators of the inflationary model. They proposed a form of f of r that is r squared form, right? Explains yeah. the inflationary epoch of the universe. Yeah. And then based on that, they, they, it's now called the Tarovinsky model of f of r. You know, depending on your motivation, you can you can use that uh, form of uh, the model. But the problem is now, does this okay? It might describe the inflationary epoch, but does it describe the large scale stuff? Does it describe the accelerated expansion? And this kind of physical constraints will make it not to be the most viable model of the society. Yes, there is an R squared model of gravity, but it's not the most favored one because it doesn't describe. But then there are other more complicated forms of the FFR theory like the Tusaviki and other modified star of Unisky models that describe the more or less the full form of the cosmological evolution from early epochs to the late time. Uh, and those are nowadays considered to be the most viable. But it's R squared. So, um, um, I would okay. like to go to Beatrice. Beatrice, do I okay. was your answer, uh, was your question answered or you have a follow-up? Okay. All right. I say yes. Ah, okay, she's not responding. Maybe you have more questions or? Uh, yes. Uh, so it's like um, uh, the, the modified uh, theories of gravity versus dark energy and dark matter prof. Which one are more like or preferable by the scientist? Uh. You ask me the modified theories. If you ask the people in favor of the dark energy and dark matter scenarios, then those are the ones. But to be honest with you, the yeah. consensus to be, seems to be that cosmology is based on it's general relativity physics, based on general relativity, relativity that has dark matter in it, right? Although people have not detected it, but they say it's a matter of time before we detect it. And you might have already attended some lectures on that, even in CERN physics, other observations, I, I think observational probes, they try to detect dark matter directly because they are so convinced that 
राखू मार दे एंड The main reason people prefer this dark energy, dark matter assumption is that the theory of gravity, general relativity, is a very eloquent, a very um, elegant, rather, uh, theory that you know modifying it is you know uh, destroying beauty, the beauty of physics itself, because it has also managed to describe the solar system physics very well. So. most people think that there must it looks like we have a we have a problem with uh, amari and so is there a relativity based on dark energy described by the cosmological constant plus the 25% of matter content coming from dark matter is what most people think is uh, the way to go but again there are a very large number of you know cosmologists with so many different types of you saw the evolution i showed this evolution uh, physics and gravitation and all that for a reason my question is to bring this us here i mean should we really consider jar complete by uh, by people like einstein or are, are is there some further uh, theory to explore and to be discovered and i am i am of the opinion that you know just like Newton's idea was replaced by Einstein, and Einstein uh, and Newton's uh, replacement of Aristotle's physics. And like, I think Einstein's theory of gravity should also be modified somehow to have higher level correction to the yeah. and some form of let's say quantum gravity maps. Like also combining quantum uh, mechanics with gravitational fields might also be. All right yeah yeah okay let's move on i can leave, i can leave it to the to the end no problem all right so in summary i have tried to show that our knowledge of physics uh, relies on careful and unbiased reproducible and objective analysis yes i might have a theory but it has to pass through the observational aspect the peer review aspect the reproducibility aspect of uh, the scientific method otherwise you might have general relativity if it fails it has to be replaced by something else and that's exactly what's happening now that has failed to solve some of the most uh, important problems so it might be reproduced it might be replaced by something higher than general relativity may not be that general relativity is completely wrong because it describes things at the astrophysical scales very well but it might be that the new theory that should replace it should include general relativity as a correct limiting limit in astrophysical scales then i have also mentioned that the universe yes it has evolved but our understanding of the universe has also evolved over time and the biggest mystery of all is you know our current ignorance uh on the 95% dark stuff but we should not be ashamed of that ignorance you know we should instead appreciate the complexity of the nature and the universe itself and strive our best to understand it bit by bit past it okay that's all i have to say from my Uh, Amari, thanks very much uh, for this uh, uh, comprehensive, um, uh, basic um, overview of, of the issues uh, in the cosmology and so forth. I think this is very good. Um, we had a lot of discussion and questions throughout. Um, I would like to go to Said, uh, who has uh, his hands raised. Said, Said. Yeah, sure. Yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. 
Uh, actually, my first question is this. I noticed something towards the very end of the presentation while you were actually mentioning some new theor modified theories. Could you please go to that slide, please? All right. Can it be here or? Slide with that. Just come down, come down, come down, come down a bit, come down a bit, a bit, come down a bit. Okay. Yeah. Yes, yes, yeah, it's okay, it's okay. Yeah, there was, no, just calm down a bit. There was this theory of uh, Einstein, there was this Einstein ether theory that I saw there. I was uh, just wondering actually, I don't know what the theory is all about, but there is this, you know, from the Mitchell's interferometer experiment, I think they already concluded that there's nothing like a hypothetical medium called ether. So I was just wondering what could possibly be the meaning of S10 Hitha theory, if nothing like Hitha exists. You are right, it's actually a misnomer. So ether was this kind of uh, exotic theory that permitted all of it, right? I was understanding uh, at the time, uh, uh, early 1990, uh, Hundred or uh, late, but yes, it has been confirmed that ether does not exist according to experiment. But the analogy here is that there might be some kind of fluid form that permits all of space, like dark energy is by the way. Dark energy is like thought of as uh, ether, right? Because it's per thought to permit all of space. We cannot see it. We cannot measure it. Uh, so far, you can only see the effect of the absolute expansion. So that's basically the kind of analogy that uh, the Einstein ether theory is trying to put forward. But the ether here is some kind of scalar field that permits. Uh, okay. Um, Taib, is that uh, satisfy or you have a follow up? Yes, 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 it's uh, satisfiable, but I've still got another question, please. What's the other question? Yes, I, I got one. I have, I have one question more, please. Please go ahead. Okay, thank you. Yeah, um, I, before, I ask, before I ask the question, I would, like to, I would like to confirm something. Considering the geometry of the universe, do you say we are close to, we, do you say the universe is close or flat? I mean, what's the conclusion on the geometry of the universe now? Yeah, uh, observations seem to suggest that the geometry is very close to flat. So the so observations are, are showing something like in normalized uh, terms. We are talking about uh, this omega k, the fractional energy density coming from the curvature field, is somewhere between minus 0 0.05 and 0. They do not ex Exactly excluded to be non flat or non closed, or I mean, non open or non closed, they just say okay, it has to be somewhere here. But zero is in there, you know, so it's very close. That's the current. Okay, um, my worry was just that I was just wondering because the planet Earth itself, it's not flat. It's, it's like it's kind of spherical, probably jawed in shape. So I was wondering that in deciding or determining or in determining the, the geometry of the universe, does the geometry of the components of what is inside the universe, does it play any role in deciding what the geometry of the universe is? No, no. You know, the, the of course, I mean, in a sense, it does because, as I said earlier, what makes a geometry is the matter content, right? But what it means now to say the universe is more or less flat is that if you look at the large scale structure distribution based on the, the presence of matter in it, It is showing that the, the, 
curvature. This is, by the way, history curvature. The curvature of the universe is very close to being flat than closed. But again, the, the curvature of the Earth, the Earth being a, a significant component of the universe. Just like, for example, one might say, okay, the universe is uh, getting cooler and cooler over time, right? But the Earth is getting warmer and warmer, but the two is not. Means that the Earth's temperature rising is not becoming. Um, Amari, we didn't hear that last part very well. Could you just repeat that, that last part of your explanation? That the part where I said the Earth's temperature rising does not, for example, yes. because the two are of completely different scales. Um, okay, we want uh, one last question. We've discussed a lot and we've gone uh, quite over time. Any more? Somebody has uh, one last question. In fact, you can. Yes, please. Yeah, you can always contact uh, uh, you know Amari by email. We have his email, and and you know uh, you can contact me, and I will introduce you to him. Uh, so Beatrice, go ahead. My last question is uh, on modified theory of gravity. I've seen that each of them have its action. And I would like to know that like the physical meaning of um, action, like if we take the one of FR gravity relating to the space or to the universe. So the action is basically from uh, classical mechanics in your uh, derivations of the uh, equations of motion. In classical mechanics, you could write total uh, Lagrangian of the system to be the, the difference between the kinetic and the energy, right? Then by minimizing this quantity called the action, you by the applying the least action principle and the variational principle to describe the equation of motion. So the action is the source of Follow the least action in that systems will always want to flow towards regions of lower energy or minimum energy. And that quantity that gives you this kind of uh, uh, principle. in mathematical terms, of course, then you have to include the Lagrangian of matter integrated over all the space, and that's your action. Um, yeah, hey, Beatrice, that's, I think uh, that, that is clear. Yeah, I think from the, uh, the action from, from physical mechanics, yeah, we can reformulate Newton mechanics in terms of uh, either a Lagrangian or a Hamiltonian or or, or, and, and define the action. Okay. Um, so um, yeah, that a fresh, a fresh uh, overview of that uh, could be useful if, uh, if necessary. Is that uh, did that answer your question, uh, Beatrice? Yes, please. All right. So um, I think um, we should thank Professor uh, Amalia Bebe for this uh, nice. Uh, overview. Um, he was supposed to come to the African School of Physics uh, in Morocco. So when, uh, when things up, uh, um, gets better, uh, we'll have the opportunity to meet him again. Uh, like he said, uh, he and I go back 
way all the way to 2008, then 2010. Um, so uh, he's. Um, uh, definitely somebody that we want to keep uh, well connected to the African School of Physics uh, or to physics in general, astrophysics and cosmology in Africa. So Amari, thanks very much for taking the time and, and taking us through uh, this uh, um, preliminary uh, and basic version of, uh, of, of cosmology. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. All right, so um, uh, with that, um, um, I think we should stop today. And thanks to everybody who uh, got connected. If you have more questions for Amari, please don't hesitate, just uh, contact him. His email address is on the agenda page. So if you don't find it, let me know and I will get you in contact with him. Okay. All right, okay, ciao, bye everyone. Yeah, bye. Thank you.